in this episode of Detroit Performs, an inclusive center to learn new art forms, how Orchestra Hall came to fruition, and a jazz club. It's all ahead in this edition of Detroit Performs. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, the Kresge Foundation, the A. Paul and Carol C. Scott Foundation, the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs, the National Endowment for the Arts, the DeRoy Testamentary Foundation, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to Detroit Performs. I am your host, DJ Oliver, and today I'm coming to you once again from my living room as we stay at home to make sure each other is safe out there during this COVID-19 situation. I'm hoping all of you are doing well and staying safe as we continue to bring you great arts and culture from right here in Metro Detroit. First up, the Center for Performance Arts and Learning encourages people of all ages and abilities to take classes in their arts of diverse cultures. Take a look. Nothing holds me back. If I can dance, I'll do it. This is the Center for Performance Arts and Learning. This is where culture and diversity comes together. This is where 6 to 600 is our new hashtag. Age is not a limit. Your ethnicity is not a limit. Your gender is not going to hold you back. Your beliefs don't hold you back. We strive to bring an all-inclusive and safe environment for any walk of life, any human being that wants to be an artist can come here and be welcome here and be a part of what feels like a family. Nandita has a great heart for people and she pushes, we want everybody to be comfortable and we want everybody to try something they've never tried before. So this is a very unique place. We are actually right at the border of Nova and Wixom. We were looking for something which was easily accessible. But I think when we walked in, sounds cliche, but the space just seemed right. This is basically a springboard for young instructors, for young artists, for people who want to learn, and they can, they're in a very safe space. It is so important for people to learn about other art forms because it's the same way about learning history or learning math or learning reading. It creates a holistic view of the world. In the dance world or in the music world, a lot of what is competitive leads to broken self-esteem, leads to, you know, broken dreams. So we're trying in our own little way, trying to build people back up, I guess. I think what really causes confidence to grow here is that nurturing environment. So you see people walking in who have never taken this class before grow from complete beginner to very, very fluent in the motions. And it's so cool to see that really positive, really nurturing environment really helping inspire people to succeed. We have four basic areas, dance, music, um, art, along with creative expression. Creative expression includes languages, speech classes, communication classes. Music, of course, covers you know your drums and guitar. That was the four basic areas we started work with, drum, guitar, voice, and keyboard. Now we've expanded into viola, violin, flute. Uh, we are talking to a cello instructor as well. I teach voice, and I'm going to be the one directing the community choir that's going to be an incredibly wide age range, which I find to be very unique. You don't really see a lot of community choirs anywhere that have age ranges from early high school or even middle school to middle age. It really doesn't matter what age you are. We do have a student who has actually been invited to sing for the Pistons. He's going to be singing the national anthem for Pistons um, in March. It makes me proud to see them thriving. Dance classes cover your ballet, tap, jazz, international dance styles, classical dance styles, um, aerial arts. We just introduced a mixed aerial arts class and then fitness. Some of the really unique ones that we have are the aerial silks classes or the lyra classes. Our aerial program has grown over the last year a lot um, because of the commitment 
that I've made for it and what the vision that I've wanted for it in Nandita has backed me up all the way, which is great. We went from having two straight fabrics to now all these other apparatuses and all these different things that these students can learn. I like the fact that it takes a lot of strength and it's a very difficult discipline. I want the students to leave every week how I felt when I first started, which was when I got in my car, I didn't want to leave. I wanted to go back in and just keep playing. It's a great stress reliever. It's a workout. I mean, if you're on that apparatus for 45 minutes to an hour, even if you're on and off of it, you're burning calories, you're building muscle, you're building confidence. There's a lot of Bollywood style dance classes that we have that you really can't find at a lot of places nearby. One. Two. I teach Bollywood classes. I teach both classical, semi-classical, and you know, your contemporary Bollywood music-based classes. If an instructor has a passion for it, we can tell. Our biggest strength is our instructors. They're all qualified. They're all passionate teachers. That is what makes them so unique. I just love it because she's seen what I can do and we get along really well and can communicate just fine and she kind of just has thrown the ball in my court, allows me to create my own syllabus, allows me to just be creative with the students, set goals with them. This is the most comfortable way to step out of your comfort zone. Uh, there are things you can do here that you never thought you would do, but it's the most comfortable way to do it. If you're sitting there watching this, just do it. There is nothing holding you back. We are here and we want to have you here. We want to help you succeed here. When we started about two years ago, we just started with this one building, pure dance classes. Today we are sitting at two different studios with about 23 different classes we offer. The goal is still to work with as many people as possible. It's very satisfying. It, it makes us happy to see that we are able to do what we are able to do. I want to bring love to the community, a smile at the very least, and something that they fall in love with at the most. Because at the end of the day, I truly feel like art is what makes us human, and when we love art, we're able to love people. So I want to kind of share that with the world. I want to share that with every person that walks in these doors. You can learn more about the Center for Performance Arts and Learning, as well as all the artists that we feature on DetroitPerforms.org. Can you believe Detroit's historic orchestra hall was built in six months? Up next, you'll learn the feat of creating one of the top acoustic halls in the world came to fruition in a short period of time. Take a look. I envy my early predecessor, Mr. Gabirovich, because he basically said, I'll be your music director if you build me a hall. I can't even imagine myself getting away with that. It would be nice someday, but not gonna happen. I can't fathom it. To me, it's mind boggling. What they did in the time they did it. When we were beginning construction, if we'd gone down the footings and we saw how it was built with hand laid bricks and the labor and unheard of. The fact that this was all done under duress, otherwise Gabrilovich was going to leave, it's just this remarkable kind of made for prime time story that now we have the legacy of, of getting to perform here. Asap Gabrilovich's gambit had worked. A booming automotive industry in Detroit had also allowed philanthropy to thrive, and many benefactors like Horace Dodge were able to support the idea that the Detroit Symphony Orchestra needed a home. In 1919, when the building was built, Detroit was just exploding across the landscape. The population tripled in a mere 20 years, and so buildings tended to be really important markers of what a city thought of itself. And so this building, Orchestra Hall, was one of the flags in the, you know, that was planted that says this is an important building because this is an important town. Clara Clemens, Gabrilovich's wife, the daughter of Mark Twain. She has written a book entitled My Husband Gabrilovich, 
And she talks in there that they were in such a race to get this building built that they began demolishing the front doors of the church while there was still a wedding going on at the altar. They worked around the clock and Horace Dodge was very instrumental to that whole process. Horace Dodge was not the only Detroit luminary who had a hand in the architectural fate of the proposed hall. The Detroit Symphony Society gathered a committee that included Albert Kahn to select an architect for the project. C. Howard Crane did uh, several major theaters in Detroit, including what is now the Detroit Opera House, including the Fox Theater, the former State Theater, and of course, Orchestra Hall. And I think he decided, along with the civic creators, uh, that we were going to use a Renaissance-inspired imagery, which was always used at that time as a marker for elegance, authenticity, permanence. And so this was one of the buildings that said Detroit has arrived. They opened finally on October 23rd, 19. 19- 19. And even at that, there, there were still workmen leaving from the back doors. I think as amazing as the amount of time it took to build it was the cost to build it. And I think it was six or seven hundred thousand dollars back in 1919. I mean, really, is there anything we can't do if we put our minds to it? I, I think this is just an example of what it takes. I mean, when somebody draws a line like Asif Gavrilovich and says, I will be your maestro if you build me a hall. Okay, we will. And we did. They figured it out, and they did it, and they didn't have computers. And these kinds of buildings where it's, it's a little on the angle, not, everything's not lined up perfectly, they sound magnificent. It's a pristine acoustic environment. Crane's lyric-style design for the hall, much unlike his other theaters, helped deliver acoustic perfection. The use of ornamentation and asymmetry added to that magic as well, all the way down to the decision to use two different kinds of wood to construct the stage. I think one of the qualities is the the space, the amount of plaster in the walls, the amount of reverberating space above the boxes and above the stage, probably up in the ceiling too in the shape. I mean, when you look at it, man, the entire hall kind of looks like a megaphone, you know? So as soon as you hit a note, boom, here, the note starts to travel like this. A concert program at the time boasted that Orchestra Hall would become the center of Detroit's musical life. And for the next decade, the hall lived up to its billing. Classical giants like Strauss, Stravinsky, and Prokofiev stood at its podium as guest conductors, while artists like Sergei Rachmaninoff, Enrico Caruso, and Anna Pavlova graced its stage, all under the tireless and demanding musical direction of Gabrilovich. Gabrilovich, I think was maybe five foot six, five foot eight, but he just had this towering presence. By the mid-1920s, this orchestra is playing in New York, getting highly complimentary reviews, and he's bringing attention to this this orchestra and the city. I don't think in 1914 anyone could have foreseen that within a decade that this orchestra would be such a major player, and that is attributable to Gabrilovich and this hall. Gabrilovich, uh, in another gesture, of his, um, I guess, forthrightness, his direct way of behaving. He identified an education director who was active in in Missouri, actually, in Kansas City, St. Louis, those areas, Edith Rhett Stilton. She had a concert program there for young people. And he said, I want to arrange a marriage between the the Detroit Symphony Orchestra and the people of Detroit and Michigan. And she came here and she became the first full-time education director of an American orchestra. Edith Retz Tilton and Victor Kolar, the assistant conductor, they were just continually performing for and educating thousands of kids. And that was something that got traction in the community. It got noticed in the media. It was recognized as an example in the country. It's just been part of our DNA for a long time. You're using outreach to create the next generation of supporters, the next generation of listeners. You establish a relationship with young people and they hear three, four, five concerts in elementary school. I think that the consistent presence of the orchestra 
in the school system and playing for the kids definitely has a positive effect on the students as they get older. While Gabra Lubitsch sought to broaden the appeal of a symphony orchestra in a Midwestern metropolis like Detroit, by the 1930s, it was clear that much darker challenges lay ahead. You can do everything right, and if the economy turns south, you're gonna have trouble. And of course, the, the Great Depression, you know, we're talking about you know, the worst economic downturn in the history of modern civilization happened in the 1930s, and Detroit in particular was hit very, very hard. You have to remember that Detroit was a boom town automobiles, you know, and it became famous. And then finally, what, ha what happens to boom towns in general? They bust. And they start over, or, or it becomes a ghost town. And, you know, there were a few years where Gavrilovich did not take a salary, where the musicians had to take pay cuts, and the number of concerts were reduced just to keep the orchestra from, from going under. And so they're fighting that battle. And then in 1936, Gavrilovich dies. Both the premature death of its leader and a mounting debt due to the Great Depression had caused the orchestra to abandon its home. Now, only 20 years since its construction and with the nation on the brink of a Second World War, it was unclear how Gavrilovich's acoustic marvel would soldier on. I think that the orchestra has a good chance of not leaving Orchestra Hall if Gavrilovich doesn't die because he, more than anyone, was connected with this hall. It was built at his bequest. He knew what was special about it, and I don't believe that he would have allowed the orchestra to leave. So history could have been very different had he not passed away. Now let's check out some upcoming events coming to you virtually from around the D. Next up, WRCJ's Linda Yon catches up with Dave Sharp of the Blue Llama Jazz Club to chat about the club's first year and how they're making the most of the COVID-19 situation by offering five different carry-out and delivery options. Also by utilizing social media to share performances while also giving back to the community. Hi, it's Linda Yon and it's my pure pleasure and honor to talk with my friend Dave Sharp at the Blue Llama Jazz Club. Dave, how are you? I'm doing pretty well, Linda. It's good to see you. All right. So tell us all about um, Blue Llamas, a little bit of the beginnings, because I know there's a lot of people who are not yet hip to the magic of the Blue Llama Jazz Club. And then let's talk about where Blue Llama is today and where it's going. Sure. Yeah, well, Blue Llama Jazz Club, open last year right around this time so it's our one year anniversary right about now and throughout that one year period we hosted live jazz um, five days a week wednesday through sunday uh, we had local groups regional groups and touring jazz artists coming through and we have a full menu we have an executive chef serving amazing cuisine, which is uh, called American Shared Plates. Right now, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we have pivoted just like many restaurants have 
um, to carry out and delivery service. And we actually have four pop-up restaurants that have sprung forth from the Blue Llama Jazz Club. One is called Blue Llama Express, where you can get Blue Llama menu items if you've already been there. Um, another one is called Hibarito, which is a Latin cuisine pop-up. Um, there's a Rice and Men, which is our uh, Asian cuisine pop-up. There's Chef Ava's Bakery, which is um, our, our pastry chef Ava. You can order goodies or little kits to make goodies at home. And there's also the Blue Llama Wine Cellar, too, if you want to order a few bottles of wine, a very nice wine, and get them delivered to your home, you can do that, too. We're also providing meals for um, the Delana Center, and we've been working together with um, food gatherers and getting meals to healthcare workers who work with uh, IHA, uh, the medical organization IHA. And we've been doing some uh, live streams as well as streaming some archive performances. There's a storm in the Gulf, yeah. Tell me about the, the way that the management team of the club decided to pivot and go this way. Made a lot of quick decisions, you know, like back near the end of March, it was getting a little crazy and, you know, things were kind of happening fast. Um, so we, within about the period of about four or five days, we pivoted into the delivery and takeout service. We do provide family meals for up to four people to industry workers who have been hit by the COVID-19 pandemic, where if you're in the restaurant industry, or if you know if you were a server or you know bartender at Blue Llama or in the neighborhood in downtown Ann Arbor, uh, you can call in and order a family meal for later in the evening and pick it up at no cost. Wow! So that's that's you know that's you know because the industry professionals we know because we're, we're 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 them and we you know have an entire team have been hit pretty hard as well as musicians you know music all. I mean, I'm a musician and everyone I know has zero gigs for the near future. Like there's all the gigs are gone. Um, one way we're helping out in that respect is we're broadcasting um, on Facebook, YouTube and bluelamaclub.com, our website. We, we post that all three places. Our past performances of people who played the club and when we when we broadcast those, we post their Venmo or PayPal info. So if people are watching at home and they enjoy the show, they can, you know, contribute to the artist directly. So it's a way for artists who are not working at the moment to, you know, get a little income. I think I speak for everyone that we're really grateful that you're based in Ann Arbor, Michigan, with such um, a fantastic mission to take care of people, culture, and food all at the same time. Thank you. You are so welcome, and, and thanks for, you know, kind of framing it that way. That That is part of the mission of the Blue Llama Jazz Club, is to, you know, unite the love of food with the love of music. Um, you know, to be able to have both experiences under one roof. You know, it's also a way to support the community. You know, we, we have a lot of um, local artists who play at the club regularly. A lot of artists from Detroit, a lot of artists from Lansing, um, artists from Toledo, Ohio, you know, regionally in the Midwest. That's something we want to continue is, you know, reaching out to all of these, all, all of our surrounding communities and um, be able to present all this great music that's out there and, you know, and have people come in and have a good experience. And that wraps it up for this edition of Detroit Performs. As always, for more arts and culture, head to DetroitPerforms.org, where you'll find featured videos, blogs, and information on upcoming arts events. Also, check us out on Facebook and Twitter. Make sure you guys are staying safe out there. 
and we'll continue to bring the best of Detroit's art scene. Until next time, get out there and show the world how Detroit performs, y'all. I'm DJ Oliver. Thanks for watching, guys. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, the Kresge Foundation, the A. Paul and Carol C. Scott Foundation, the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs, the National Endowment for the Arts, the DeRoy Testamentary Foundation, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.